Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. We're thankful for this day. We're able to come together in the name of the Lord. And we've got special Sunday school service for you today. I think you're going to enjoy it. Not only uh, today at 10, but also at 11 and 6. And um, introduce this gentleman in just a few minutes about coming and being a, a part of this week, ministering to um, the body here of Christ at First Free Will Baptist Church in a different way. And um, how many of us know everything? <laughs> how many of us know? Don't point at your wife, Brother Larry. That'll get you in trouble. <laughs> how many of us would like to learn more about the Lord and about the earth and about? Sure we would. Um, that's how we're going to be able to witness to those who don't believe um, and everything that we do in the house of the Lord, we want it to bring edification. Last night I woke up and the Lord gave me a message. I'm not going to preach it today, but on, on lead. And if we're going to have leadership and if we're going to lead, the first thing that we've got to do, the Lord spoke to me, was you've got to love people. If you don't love the people that you're trying to lead, you won't lead in the right direction. The next thing is every time that you meet with people, there needs to be edification. That means you need to build them up. You need to help them. And then the third thing was uh, uh, the, the A, L-E-A. And A was this. All things need to be covered. You know, if you've got a business and that business is, and you want to have a successful business, you better make sure that you cover everything because one thing can cost you the business. And then the fourth thing on the D is, did you accomplish what you felt called to do? And so I hope that this morning that we're, we're able to, you're able to feel the love in this place and that you're edified in learning more about God's truth from the Word of God and that we cover as many things as we can because we can't cover Genesis through Revelation, can we? And then also, you know, did we accomplish what we set out to do? And so this morning before uh, we introduce our speaker, we want to go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing over the service. Let us pray. Kind Jesus, we come before you again this side of eternity. And God, we praise you for who you are. God, we thank you for your perfect absolute truth Bible that you've given to us to be our road map Lord as we walk in this world God I pray that you would touch us help our minds to be able to receive the information God give us understanding and God I pray Father that you touch our speaker this morning and God I pray above all things Lord for someone that doesn't believe in you Lord, may they come to know you as Lord and Savior of their life. And God, will praise you for this. Lord, we ask that you touch the sick. So many are sick right now and hurting. And God, we speak healing into them. And God, we ask Jesus that you bless our services today and through this week. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the sweet, sweet Holy Ghost Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. well, at this time, I'll, I want you to make welcome he is of Creation Worldview Ministries. He is a missionary teacher, and he is a biblical scientific creationist and also apologist of the Word of God. Would you make welcome Dr. Grady McMurtry? Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'd shake your hand, but you're not down here. Good morning. Oh, dear. I tell you, you, you guys are kind of cold. Is that the idea? I told folks who walked in this morning, they said it was cold. I said, no, this is a spring day in Moscow. I go to Russia twice a year in the wintertime. I'll be going there for February. I'll be going over to Siberia. It'll be minus 40. Hello? So with that in mind then, this is the day the Lord hath made. Is that correct? Amen. You shall rejoice in it as a command. It's not an option. Is that right? So let's try that one more time, okay? Good morning. Good morning. Now it's a little better. I think you guys still need a little warm-up, but you got another two services today to tr get it right. Well, I'm Dr. Gray McMurtry. I am a biblical scientific creationist. I do teach on the subject. We'll be here through Wednesday night. But uh, I, I got to tell you, 
I would rather teach Sunday school than anything else I do. And I am serious about that. I love Sunday school. I really do. So I want you to think of this as just a big Sunday school class. I know we're kind of separated out a bit, but just think of it as a big Sunday school class. And when I ask questions, I'm really looking for answers. Okay? Okay. Yes, sir. You, you missed it. That was a question, folks. <laughs> Only two of you got it right. Let's try that again. Okay? okay? See, that's so much better. That's really so much. Now, those of you who are here in Sunday school this morning, you are going to get a head start on the folks that are coming tonight at 6. Let me tell you why. Because we're going to be talking about the flood of Noah at 6 o'clock tonight. We're going to show you the Bible is absolutely accurate about the details of a worldwide flood occurring approximately 4,500 years ago. Now, the reason I say you're going to be getting a head start on them is this. You're going to know the right thing when you get here at 6 o'clock tonight, and they're not because they weren't here. Hello? Come on, you're supposed to make people jealous of the Word, right? So I'm going to ask all of you, first of all, and remember, Brother Chris is listening now, would you agree with me that all Christians are supposed to share their faith in Christ with others? Okay, this side seems to be doing quite well over here. You guys are not quite... I said all Christians are called to share their faith in Christ with others, Right? Oh, I'm telling you, you guys need caffeine. Uh, well, tell me something. How many of you have tried to share your faith in Christ with somebody else, and you have had this response, or at least something very similar? Well, if you could just prove to me that God existed, then I would be willing to believe. You ever had that response? You try to share Christ, and, and they said, well, if you could just prove to me that God existed, then I'd be willing to believe. Well, folks, I'm going to show you how you can prove that God not only exists, but He is actively working throughout human history. And you're going to be able to use this as a tool in evangelism. So in order to show you how to do that, I'm going to ask you to open up to the convenience store verse of the Bible with me. You're not turning. The convenience store verse of the Bible. That's Genesis 7:11. I told you, y'all need caffeine. <laughs> Come on. No teacher has taught until a student has learned. Please tell me, will you ever forget the convenience store verse of the Bible? Hello? See, it works, doesn't it? So let's take a look at Genesis 7, 11. Now you'll notice it says there, and we're going to talk more about it tonight, but it says that the flood of Noah began on the 17th day of the seventh month. Now I think you'll agree with me, many dates in the Bible are rather nebulous. You know, like in the third year of the reign of king, who cares, such and such a thing happened, right? But when God is so specific, there must be a reason, is that right? And those dates are there for a reason. So first of all, when did the flood of Noah begin? It's the 17th day of the seventh month. So what time of the year was that? Please tell me. Come on, it's just a big Sunday school class. July the 17th. Now that is an interesting answer. I, I think I've very rarely had that one. Anybody else? Okay, some folks said February, and I can understand why you would say that, the 17th day of the second month, right? Uh, but uh, anybody else? Well, see, folks, what I'm trying to point out to you is that's not our calendar. Nowhere in the Bible do you have the Julian or the Gregorian calendar. And in the book of Genesis, the only calendar you have is called the Jewish civil calendar. And the Jewish civil calendar begins with a feast or festival of the Old Testament called Rosh Hashanah. Now in Hebrew, Rosh means chief or head of. Rosh Hashanah means chief or head of the year. It's what you and I call New Year's Day. But in the Jewish civil calendar, New Year's Day occurs in what we think of as mid to late September. Rosh Hashanah occurs in mid to late September, the way you and I would count time. So think with me for just a moment. If the year begins in mid to late September, when did the flood of Noah begin? Well, we go one month, that's mid to late October. Uh, we go 17 days into the second month. We're talking about roughly the first week of November, is that correct? And so we know that the flood of Noah actually began about the, uh, well, first week of November, as you and I would count time. And if you take a look at Genesis 8.4, Genesis 8.4 says that the ark of Noah came to rest on the 17th day of the seventh month. Now, I'm going to ask an interesting question here, I hope. Um, can anybody here tell me why there are 360 degrees in a circle? Not even the young people that are still in school? 
No. Well, there's a good reason there's 360 degrees in a circle, folks. I mean, wouldn't it be more logical if there was 100 or 400? Wouldn't that be more logical? I mean, 360 is an interesting number, don't you think? But it goes back to the book of Genesis. It goes back to when God created the earth, the universe. Take a look at the last verse of chapter 7 in Genesis. You notice it says there that the waters of the flood rose, prevailed, continued to rise for exactly 150 days. Is that correct? You see, in the Jewish calendar, every month is exactly 30 days long. You never have 28, 29, 31. Every month has 30 days. Now, when it says that the waters rose for 150 days, that means the waters rose for five months, correct? Five times 30 is 150, right? And in the Bible, the number five is associated with the concept of grace. Now, think with me for just a moment. God sent a worldwide flood in judgment. The waters rose for exactly five months. Then God stopped the waters rising. The ark comes to rest. In God's grace, he stops the waters rising. And if you continue to read in chapter 8, you'll find out the waters went down for another 150 days. That the earth was actually covered for 300 days with water. Now, where did the 360 days come from? When God started the Bible, he started with 12 months. That's why we still have 12 months today. And, of course, 12 times 30 is? Come on, folks. There you go, 360. And from the time of creation 6,000 years ago, for 1,656 years, the earth rotated at 360 days in a year. That's why there's 360 degrees in a circle but the events of the flood caused the rotation rate of the earth to change for good scientific reasons we could substantiate. Today it's 365 and a quarter. But it used to be 360. So that's why we have 360 degrees in a circle. And these things are important to our Bible studies to understand these things. So let's think. When did the ark come to rest? Well, if the flood begins about the first, maybe second week of November, five months later it's going to be roughly late March or early April. Is that correct? And it says in Genesis 8, 4, it was the seventh month of the civil calendar. Now, the seventh month of the civil calendar is called the month of Nisan. N-I-S-A-N. It's like the car, but with only one S. Okay? Now, we all agree Genesis 8, 4, the ark came to rest on the 17th day of the month of Nisan. Is that correct? Come on, folks, you're still with me, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Now, I said we want to prove that God is alive, actively working throughout human history. Would you please turn to the book of the Exodus, chapter 12? The book of the Exodus, chapter 12. Start reading the first two verses. It says that God speaks to Aaron and to Moses. And he says, I want you to make this month the first month of a brand new calendar. It's a calendar for the purpose of religious events. Many Christians fail to understand some great biblical truths, not because they are a mystery, but because they fail to understand that there are two calendars and not one. There's the civil calendar that begins in mid to late September. Then there is the religious calendar that begins in the spring, late March, early April. Everybody with me so far? Now, remember that Exodus 12, this is the time of Moses. Now, think about Moses for just a moment. God raised up Moses in the house of Pharaoh for 40 years. Now, why did God arrange that to happen? You see, you have your academy here, correct? I'm an educator. I am concerned about you, but I'm also concerned about your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. Why did God raise up Moses in Pharaoh's house for 40 years? He wanted Moses to have the finest education money could buy. Did you hear that? Moses was a highly educated man. Now, he may have had a speech impediment. That's not the issue. He was a highly educated, very smart guy. And God wanted him to have the highest education money could buy, had him raised in the house of Pharaoh. And I got a word for you this morning. What does God want for us in the United States today? He wants highly educated young men and women who can articulate the Christian faith intelligently, rationally. Yes, by faith, but intelligently and rationally as well. Hello? Now, of course, what happened next? Well, God arranges things so that Moses will have to go out into the desert for 40 years to learn how to raise sheep and goats, correct? 
This was in order to prepare Moses to be a pastor. Brother Chris is chuckling. <laughs> Hello. And then at the age of 80, he sends him back into Egypt with a message, it's time to let my people go, correct? Pharaoh will not allow this, and God will send 10 plagues. Now, why 10 plagues? Well, in the Bible, the number 10 is the number of perfect spiritual completion. I mean, think about it. Why are there 10 commandments? It's the perfect number to complete God's law. Why were there 10 plagues in Egypt? It was the perfect number of plagues to accomplish God's purposes in Egypt. And we see it many, many times, correct? Now, there were nine plagues before Exodus 12, 1. But in the ninth, first nine plagues, God is dealing with the Egyptians personally, one-on-one. -on -one. But the tenth plague is when the people get involved. Now, I want you to think about this. Take a look. It says, Exodus 12, 1, 2, that you're to make this month the first month. And so Nisan becomes the first month of a new calendar. So what does God do? He takes the seventh month of the civil calendar... He makes it the first month of the religious calendar, also of 12 months. Everybody with me so far? Now, as you start to read down into verses 3, 4, 5, 6, you'll notice it says, on the 10th day of that month, God, through Moses, commands the people to select one lamb, one for each household. Is that correct? Then 14th day of Nisan, four days later, God says, I want you to slay the lamb and apply the blood to the doorposts and to the lentil. Correct? Now, I want you to think about this for just a second. Um, they're just going to lay the lamb, and they're using a paintbrush called a hyssop plant. They're using blood, which is going to coagulate quickly. Uh, I don't know about you, but I think they're in a hurry. And, and the death angel is coming by in about three hours, right? Hello? So I think they're in a hurry. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. So what I think they do is something like this. <laughs> splat, splat, splat. That seem reasonable? But please tell me, when they go splat on the lentil, wouldn't some of the blood have a moment to drip on the threshold? And you would want blood on the threshold, wouldn't you? Come on, folks, wouldn't you? Look, do you want the death angel sliding in under the door? Hello? So what I want you to see is this. In Egypt, the blood was here, 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 and here. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, in Egypt, the blood was here, 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 and here, right? And sealed behind the door with the blood on all four sides, that night they're going to eat the lamb. Now, you have to understand something about the Jewish calendar to understand these things. Never, oh, by the way, please give me a one big, loud, hearty amen after this, if you would. Never, ever get your education from public television, amen. National Geographic, amen. Learning Channel, Discovery Channel, Amen. Animal Planet, Amen. or Hollywood. Amen. They could have been a little more demonstrative there. Amen. You know, it amazes me how many people will go to Hollywood made movies, see them on TV, whatever, and the movies have Jews in them and they think they learned something about Judaism. Hello? <laughs> I mean, how, after all, how many of you have ever seen Ben Hur? Come on, how about Charlton Heston dividing the Red Sea, right? <laughs> you know? Well, we're going to talk about that, too. But, but never get your education from Hollywood. Now, there, there is a, there's a nice movie. There, it's a nice movie. I can even recommend it, based on a Broadway musical called Fiddler on the Roof. And there's a nice song in there about sunrise, sunset. It's a pretty song. And for that reason, many, many people think the Jewish day begins at sunset. That is not true. The Jewish day does not begin at sunset. The Jewish day, the date, changes in the early evening at moon rise. This goes back to the book of Genesis. Remember God said there's one period of darkness, one period of light, one rotation, one day, correct? And the day must start in total darkness. So the day doesn't start at sunset. It starts 19 minutes after sunset when there is no twilight whatsoever. It has to be totally dark. Are you with me? So the date does not change on the Jewish calendar at midnight the way you and I do it. It changes in the early evening at moonrise. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to ask you to help me count off. Would you, would you do that? One person. Oh, dear. Well, we'll see if we can't get the rest of you involved. Now, it says on the 14th, they are to slay the lamb at exactly 3 p.m. in the afternoon. 
Now, in your Bible, it might say between the evenings, but words change meaning over time. And today that word actually means afternoon. And so between the afternoons, there's the early afternoon, the late afternoon, it's 3 p.m. Everybody with me? So they slay the lamb at exactly 3 p.m. on the 14th day of Nisan. They apply the blood to the doorpost, the lentil, and the threshold. That evening, the moon rises, the date changes, and it becomes the... Come on, folks, all you have to do is add one. Hello? Come on. If it was the 14th, it becomes the... 15th. Thank you. And the death angel goes throughout the land. And what was the 10th plague? What was it? Death of the well, some of you said death of the firstborn. Some said death of the firstborn son. But let's be more accurate. What it actually says is this. The death of the firstborn male, that opens the womb. That is the Hebrew term. It's the firstborn male that opens the womb. If a sister was born first, then it doesn't count. It has to be the male that opens the womb. Of all the people and all the cattle, is that correct? Now, remember then, in the Old Testament times, men often had more than one wife, especially pharaohs, correct? Come on, folks. Now, Ramesses II was not the pharaoh of Moses. I want you to understand that. But, but he ruled Egypt for 62 years. He had 52 sons. Do you think he had just one wife? Excuse me? No, no. That night, the pharaoh of Moses lost more than one son. And, of course, what about cattle? You know, I love teaching in an agricultural standpoint because, ladies and gentlemen, if you do not understand agriculture, you cannot understand 90% of the Bible. The Bible is written in an agrarian language to an agrarian people. And so, think with me. You only have one bull for many ladies, is that correct? So imagine the carnage in Egypt that night. Hello? It's beyond anything you have ever contemplated. And what happens? Well, about midnight on the 15th, well, Moses is called in to see Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, I surrender, you can go. And they start walking southeast in the middle of the night, told to have the Passover with their shoes on, ready to go. They start walking southeast on the night of the 15th. In the morning of the 15th, men are sent over to a town called Succoth in your Bible. Uh, but it's actually in Hebrew, the word Sukkot, but it means tabernacle. They're sent over to a town called Tabernacle to pick up the body of Joseph. Anybody find it interesting that Joseph's body has been waiting at Tabernacle all those years? And they, they pick up the body of Joseph, join the main group. They continue to walk the day of the 15th. Now that evening they stop, they make camp, the moon rises, the date changes, it becomes the? Come on, folks, just add. Yeah, thank please. 16th, okay. And they sleep that night. They get up and they walk the next day, which is the 16th. Now that evening they stop, they make camp, the moon rises, the date changes, and it becomes the? 17th. Only that night they have their backs against the Red Sea. Pharaoh will chase after them. It's the night of the 17th day of Nisan that God performed the miracle of the parting of the Red Sea. Now you told me you had seen Charlton Heston in a movie parting the Red Sea, right? Or for the, well, the younger people here, it could be Prince of Egypt. Hello? But, but tell me something. When you see these Hollywood-made movies, would you agree, when you see the parting of the Red Sea, you see this little slit in the Red Sea, right? Agreed? What? A joke. What a joke. Think with me. Our best estimate is one and a half to four million people went through that hole in roughly four hours. Now, with the exception of only a few in here, all of you could do the math. Think with me for just a moment. To get even a million and a half people through the Red Sea in only about four hours that evening, well, the hole in the Red Sea had to be at least five miles wide. Hello? When God parted the Red Sea, he kind of like parted the Red Sea. Hello? And that hole had to be at least five miles wide. Hello? And the Bible tells us that as the Jews, you know, in Corinthians it tells us when the Jews walked through the Red Sea with the water up above them on both sides of them, they were being baptized in the waters of the Red Sea. They were resurrected out of the waters of the Red Sea and that baptism onto the Sinai Peninsula to go on to the Promised Land. Is that correct? But what happened to the Egyptians who tried to follow in behind them? They perished. Is that correct? So the waters of the Red Sea were baptism to the believer but judgment to the unbeliever. Is that right? And what about the flood of Noah? Think with me for just a moment. 
We have a presentation on the ark. We deal with its physical and its supernatural, its biblical typology and so forth. And the word ark of Noah. I mean, when you read the Bible, you would tend to think of three times the word ark is used. There's the ark of Noah. There's the ark of the bulrushes, the baby Moses floating down the Nile. And there's the ark of the covenant, correct? Yes. But in Hebrew, there's only two words. The ark of Noah, ark of the bulrushes, that's one word in Hebrew. It technically means an object made for floating. And of course, that's what the ark did, right? It's an object made for floating. The Ark of the Covenant is a different word. It's a piece of furniture, which is what it was, a wood box covered in gold. It's a piece of furniture. However, would you agree with me, words often have more than one meaning, one use, one nuance. Is that correct? And the word Ark of Noah, which is technically and correctly translated an object made for floating, can also be correctly translated as the word coffin. C-O-F-F-I-N, coffin. Now, why was the Ark of Noah referred to as a coffin? Well, when you think of a coffin, don't you think of a large, rectangular, wooden box? Is that correct? And that was the shape of the Ark of Noah. It was a large, rectangular, wooden box. It did not have a bow or a stern. It didn't have propellers, sail, uh, no, no rudder. It was really a large barge. It had no specific place to go, correct? Hello? Now, think with me for a minute. The Ark of Noah, we know, would sink about halfway into the water. There were 40 days and 40 nights of rain at the beginning of the flood coming down on top of the Ark. And there's the waves pounding up on the side, right? You'd have to agree the Ark was wet, right? Yes. Now, therefore, we can make an argument that the eight people inside, I mean, think about the way that God uses opposite logic to the way you and I do things. Would you agree you've often seen God use opposite logic the way you and I do things? I mean, you know, if you've been a Christian for long, you've seen that, right? I mean, when you think of a, a coffin, you think of death inside and life outside, correct? But what is the opposite logic that God uses at the time of the flood? He takes the seeds of life, puts them inside the coffin, he condemns the world outside to death. Is that right? And as the ark is in the water, we could argue that the eight people inside were being baptized, and when the ark came to rest, they were resurrected out of that coffin into a new world. Is that correct? But it occurs on exactly the same day of the calendar that they were baptized in the Red Sea. Is that correct? You see, God has a theme for the 17th day of Nisan. The theme for the 17th day of Nisan is the theme of baptism, or I'm going to use the word internment. Would you agree that when we baptize, we intern people in the water and then raise them up because we want them to breathe? Is that right? Come on, that is the way y'all do it around here, right? Yeah. Thank you. So, so they were baptized in the Red Sea, resurrected into the new world on the 17th day of Nisan. They were baptized in the Red Sea, resurrected on the Sinai Peninsula on the 17th day of Nisan. That's God's theme, baptism or internment and resurrection. Now, if you're not convinced about what I'm saying so far, would you please turn to the book of Joshua? The book of Joshua. Now, you want to tick off these verses. By the way, uh, let me just say one thing to you. If you're having trouble keeping up with these things, uh, I have a book I wrote on the Old Testament feasts over here. What I'm sharing in Sunday school today is a page and a half out of 114 pages. Hello? We also have the Sunday school lesson on a DVT, too, if you'd like it that way. But please turn to the book of Joshua and tick off these following verses. Joshua 3.15, Joshua 4.19, Joshua chapter 5, verses 10, 11, and 12. So that's Joshua 3.15, Joshua 4.19, Joshua 5, verses 10, 11, and 12. Now, think with me. What happens after 40 years in the desert? Moses will die just before they go in, and, and what's going to happen? Joshua will lead the people into the promised land, Correct. Now, let's think about how did he do that? He commanded the priest to pick up the Ark of the Covenant and walk into the Jordan River, correct? If you look at Joshua 4.19, it says specifically it was the 10th day of Nisan. That means it's exactly 40 years to the day since they selected the Lamb in Egypt. And if you take a look at Joshua 3.15... Now, we wouldn't know it whether the Bible told us or not because, of course, this is in the spring of the year. It's late March and early April. But the Bible even tells us in Joshua 3.15, the river was flooded at that time of the year. But the Jordan is always flooded in the spring. 
This is when the snow melt comes down from Mount Hermon, and this is when the Jordan is always flooded, is in the spring of the year. It's at its deepest, its widest, its fastest in the spring. And so what happens? Think with me for just a moment. Joshua tells the priest to pick up the Ark of the Covenant and walk into the river. Now the people, the priests, in the natural looked at that river and said, if we walk into that, we are gone. Hello? But at the word of God, given through the man of God, to the people of God, they took a step of faith. Is that correct? Yes. And once they walked into the water, God did a miniature version miracle of what he had done at the Red Sea. Is that correct? And he parted the Jordan. They went across on dry land. Is that right? Yes. And it was the 10th day of the month of Nisan. Now, when you read Joshua chapter 5, verses 10, 11, and 12, it says they will celebrate the Passover. Ladies and gentlemen, this is only the third Passover in human history. It has been 40 years, but it is only the third Passover. The first Passover was in Egypt. Second Passover was one year later at Mount Sinai. But for 38 years, they did not celebrate the Passover because they didn't eat lamb and matzah. They ate manna and birds. Is that correct? So for 38 years, they could not. They didn't have the right elements. But in the 40th year, they will go into the Promised Land and they will celebrate the third Passover. Now, remember, the lamb must be slain at exactly 3 p.m. on the 14th, correct? So they go into the Promised Land on the 10th. They will then camp for three days of purification. This is exactly what they did at Mount Sinai. Then what happens? On the 14th at 3 p.m., they will slay the lamb. Now, you'll notice in Joshua 3.15 it says this, on the day after they ate the lamb, that was the last day God provided manna. So help me count again. They slay the lamb on the 14th according to the law of Moses. That evening the moon will rise, the date will change, it will become the 15th. That's the night you eat the lamb. So the day after that makes it the 16th. And that's the last day that God provided manna. So on the 17th, they ate only of the first fruits of the promised land. If you go to Leviticus chapter 23, you will find that the 17th day of Nisan is the third major feast of the Old Testament. It's called the Feast of First Fruits. But in the Bible, when you read the term first fruits, it's interchangeable with resurrection. Jesus often talked about this. He said, for instance, if a seed doesn't fall into the ground and die, it won't bring forth a great harvest. Speaking of own death, burial, and resurrection, correct? He talked about when you lift me up, not if, correct? And it was the high priest who lifted up the first fruits offering and worshiped, waved it before the Father in what's called a wave offering. And who was responsible for individually, personally lifting Jesus up that day? It's a Sunday school class, folks. Who was individually, personally responsible for lifting Jesus up? Well, he said, just as Moses lifted up the stake with the snake in the desert, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, correct? But the year Jesus died, who was individually and personally responsible for lifting him up? Wasn't it Caiaphas who, well, got the crowd to crucify Christ and take Barabbas and let him go free, is that correct? Oh. So it really was the high priest who lifted him up that day, wasn't it? Oh. Well, so far I have shown you that the uh, ark landed, they went through the Red Sea, and they ate of the first fruits on exactly the 17th day of Nisan, spread over 1,000 years of human history. Is that correct? Anybody here see the hand of God at work? Is it possible for humans to coordinate over 1,000 years of time? It's simply impossible. It is absolutely impossible. But apparently you are still not quite convinced. So in just a couple of minutes, I'm going to ask you, please turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. The Gospel of John, chapter 12. If you want all the information, we're just going to have to get to you later. But I want you to look there carefully. Now, when you read your Bible, please tell me, does it say this? John, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. That the year Jesus died, he will spend two days walking from Jericho up to the area of Jerusalem. And we're told that it was a Friday, the eighth day of Nisan. 
and that Jesus would go to see Lazarus, the man he raised from the dead. And is that what your Bible says? Your Bible says it was the eighth day of Nisan, it was a Friday, and everybody got it? No? Oh, you mean it says six days before the Passover. Is that right? Yeah. Well, think with me. The Passover lamb is slain on the 14th. So if it's six days before the 14th, what day is it? It is the 8th. Is that correct? So John says it's the 8th day of Nisan. He just doesn't say it the way you're used to. Is that right? And then it says that instead of going to the right and going into Jerusalem proper, he will turn to the left. He will go down the Mount of Olives to Bethany to visit with Lazarus, the man he's raised from the dead. And it says there that they, they served him a supper, an evening meal. Is that correct? Now that means it's after the moon rises. Is that right? And I can prove it was a Friday because think with me. He walks into the area of Jerusalem up from Jericho, turns to the left, goes down the ridge, the Mount of Olives, to Bethany. That was on the eighth day of Nisan, a Friday during the daylight hours. But that evening, the moon rises, the date changes, and it becomes the ninth. But it's also Friday night. And because it is Friday night, it is Shabbat. And on Shabbat, he cannot leave the Mount of Olives. As a righteous Jewish male, he cannot leave the Mount of Olives on Friday night and Saturday, the ninth day of Nisan. But Saturday night, the moon rises, the date changes, it becomes what? The tenth. And on Sunday, the tenth day of Nisan, he will fulfill two prophecies. He will ride in on a colt that has never been ridden before, but the people will greet him, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they, will quote, they are going to quote Psalm 118. It's a messianic psalm. Now you say Hosanna, but tell me, what does that mean in English? No? It means save now. It literally translates to save now. But when you look at an individual person and say it, it means you save us now. Save now. You save us now. And fulfillment of the prophet Daniel, he is cut off. The term cut off is an agricultural term. Remember I said if you don't understand agriculture, you cannot understand the Bible. To cut off means to remove one individual from a larger number. It means to cut one lamb out of a flock, one steer out of a herd. Don't cowboys still use cutting horses? Yeah. It's exactly the same term that Daniel would use all those years back. And on the 10th day of Nisan, a Sunday, the people will cut him off. Out of between 125 and 250,000 people, they selected one man, Jesus Christ, said, you save us now, and they cut him off. Four days later on the 14th, what did the same people say? Crucify him. Crucify him. May his blood be upon us and our children. And it is. Now, Jesus was slain. They nailed him to a cross at 9 a.m. on the morning of the 14th. He would die exactly six hours later at 3 p.m., the time that the little lamb died on the Temple Mount nearby. That left three hours for his body to be interred in the ground before the moon rises. And so what happens? That evening the moon rises. It becomes the... Come on, folks, you still got your part here. It becomes the 15th. Is that right? Next day is the 15th. Next evening the moon rises. It becomes the 16th. Next day is the 16th. Saturday night the moon rises. It becomes the 17th. And on Sunday morning, about 6 a.m. in the morning, on the 17th day of Nisan, the women were privileged to discover the resurrection. How y'all doing? Anybody here see the hand of God at work? We can prove that God exists, that he's actively working throughout human history. Is that correct? And the next time somebody says, if you could just prove to me God exists, then I'd be willing to believe. You pull out what I just showed you, and if you will, learn more about it as well. This is an absolute proof that God is alive and actively working. Think with me. All four events occurred on exactly the same day of the Jewish calendar spread over 2,500 years of human history. Hello? Can I at least get an amen, folks? Well, there's much, much more. I'm sorry we couldn't get to it all. We started just a few minutes late this morning. But if you do want to know about it more, we have the DVD. We've got the book. Uh, we have a special in the book, by the way. If you buy the book, you get the autograph for free. <laughs> or you can buy the autograph. I'll give you the book. But I do hope that you've enjoyed Sunday School as much as I have this morning. Yep. So thank you very much. I'll see you for service. I'll be in the back if I can answer any questions. Okay.